right, good afternoon, and welcome to the 15th Annual Bio CEO and Investor Conference. This is actually our last regular programming session, and I hope you'll stick around. Um, across the hall, we will have uh, two former White House Chiefs of Staff uh, sharing their thoughts on what's happening in Washington. Um, but uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Salvine Richter, who's a uh, Managing Director of Equity Research at Canaccord Genuity. Uh, she will be moderating a fireside chat with JJ Bianame from Biomarin. Great, thank you all for joining us today. And I don't think JJ really needs any introduction. Many of you know him. Um, but we're just going to basically, um, I'm gonna ask JJ questions, but if any of you would like to ask questions, please feel free to come up to the, uh, to the stand right there and, and we're happy to take any questions from the audience. But um, JJ, maybe I'll start it off with you know, just an overview. Um, you've done a really good job of developing drugs, bringing them to market with four drugs currently on the market, one potentially coming by year end, and you've also developed in-house manufacturing. So as you look at your next stage of growth and your pipeline, maybe you can just give us a viewpoint of what the, the next stage of growth is for, for Biomarin here. Mm -hmm. So obviously in the, in the short term, the, uh, uh, in addition to the currently marketed products, uh, the launch of Vimizim x um, uh, is is critical obviously uh, the the that's for you know Marcus syndrome or MPS four A uh, considering the market size um, the product has the potential to more than double uh, current biomarine sales which are about half a billion dollars so this product alone in addition to the current product should allow us to go past a billion dollars in revenues um, but beyond beyond Galenes and I guess we'll expand on that. Indeed, we have, you know, four other molecules in the clinic uh, and one about to enter the clinic. So we have lots of room for growth, lots of new slow actually even in the next uh, three to four months uh, coming up. Uh, the next milestone being the results of our phase two study uh, for BMN701 for Pompe's disease. And we should have the data, actually, well, I can tell you already, we will have the data by the end of this quarter. Um, and we are very much looking forward to it. I guess we'll spend a little time on it uh, you know, a little later, but then we got, you know, we got PECPAL for PKU, which is going to enter phase three, uh, very likely next quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, um, product for, for achondroplasia will be also in phase two, uh, pivotal, I mean, phase two, proof of concept uh, study by the middle of the year. Um, and BMN 673 or PARP inhibitor for cancer. We will present some data at ASCO at the end of May, early June, uh, which will determine which will, uh, what will be our first phase three study, which indication. Mm -hmm. uh, likely to be other BRCA, variable BRCA breast. And then we have a drug entering the clinic hopefully also next quarter. Uh, for Batten's disease, so a lot going on. We're mm -hmm. excited about it. Great. And then one question we, we get often, I think, as we look at um, kind of the focus for Biomarin, which has been rare disease and, and orphan um, slash orphan diseases. You know, Biomarin's been a pioneer here. How have you looked, how's the evolution of, of this field played out? Um, maybe when you look at reimbursement, particularly in, in both the US and EU, and then with, with pharma interest, um, big pharma interest, and how that affects a company such as yourself mm -hmm. as you look out to other programs. Yeah, I think obviously the successes of the Genzyme, Alexions, Biomarines of the world have uh, attracted some attention to the field. Um, but I think there is still a lot of opportunities. And I would say when one company does develop a product that has a significant impact, on the life expectancy or the quality of life of the patients that they treat. And when there is an unmet need that's uh, where there, is no, there are no existing therapies, uh, we don't anticipate some significant you know, reimbursement problems. We haven't seen that so far. Um, and, and I think the number of patients is so limited still uh, that the impact on the budgets of some private payers or public payers is extremely limited. And consequently, and, 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 and most of the patients that we treat with our disease, with our drugs, they consume a lot of healthcare resources, even if they're not treated with our drugs. They need hospitalization, social worker supports, 
uh, surgery and all along their life, which is extremely expensive. And, um, and I think the payers understand that. And consequently, again, as long as you develop innovative products that will really make a big difference in the, in the quality of life of the patients, I don't anticipate you know, major reimbursement problems. Have there been any changes in specific countries as you look at with the UK, with NICE taking over from NHS? I mean, has there been any changes to how those discussions are progressing? <clears throat> well, regarding the UK and NICE, I mean, the future, the future will tell. Um, I think they themselves have stated that they will not, uh, they, they will probably not use uh, quality, adjust, quality adjusted life years as a way to evaluate altorophan drugs because it's very difficult to apply that methodology to altorophan drugs. Uh, so I think, you know, assuming Vimizim is approved in Q1 of next year in Europe, uh, we will have to go through NICE uh, in the UK. Uh, but NICE is only one country. Uh, and, and, you know, the rest of Europe so far. Actually, if you look at our current products, the price of Nagazyme, our biggest product, is actually higher in Europe than it is in the US. So, and, and we have not seen any specific changes in another direction right now. Right. Maybe we'll move on to the pipeline just mm -hmm. because, you know, that's a really exciting part of the story. But um, when we look at Vimizim, you know, maybe comment on your expectations for the for regulatory approval and launch of the drug and then outside of, of the US and the big five in Europe, what are the biggest markets that you see this drug penetrating into? So similar to Nagrozyme, you know, the majority of the patients are definitely outside the US. I would say 80, 85 percent of the patients are outside the US based on the current database, the over 1,200 patients that we have identified. So obviously US is important, but most of the market is ex-US. So our current plan is indeed to file by the end of next month in the US than to file in Europe for EMA application by the end of April. And then we have a rollout, you know, I don't think we want to discuss it entirely, but we have really cheered the countries according to the opportunities and the reimbursement um, possibilities. Brazil, for instance, is going to be a very important product uh, country for us, like it is for Nagazyme. Turkey is going to be very important. But we have major experience in those countries already selling, you know, Nagazyme very, very um, successfully. Um, so we, we have a registration rollout that's going to be much more aggressive and faster than what we had for Nagazyme. The reason being that we have way more resources than we had when we launched Nagazyme. You know, when Nagazyme was approved in the U.S. in the middle of 05, we had no biomarine employees outside the U.S., zero. Mm -hmm. uh, product was approved in January in uh, 06 in Europe, and we had four employees in London. That was about it. And they were hooking up the phone and connecting the computers. Now we have, you know, over 120 people outside the U.S., and they all have major experiences dealing with registration authorities and, and uh, prescribers and payers. So uh, that's why we anticipate a faster rollout than we still uh, with Nalgazam. Plus, we, <clears throat> we're doing a lot of things that before approval that we did after approval with um, Nalgazam to support uh, reimbursement and pricing. Like uh, in the pivotal study only enrolled, for instance, patients over five years of age. We just completed a study uh, where we enroll patients under five years of mm -hmm. age to be able to make sure that they will be reimbursed for those patients. And that makes sense because the younger the patient, the more they benefit from therapy. Uh, we've done a study, uh, on, you know, we are enrolling right now a study for non-ambulatory patients, patients that spend most of their time in wheelchairs uh, to, to document the benefits of therapy in those patients in terms of uh, overall well-being, pulmonary function, and this kind of thing. So all those things are the kind of things we did after approval for Nagazab. We're doing pre-approval here. Uh, okay. And I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Brazil with our South American team, and, uh, and they're very motivated. Actually, they, they're continuing to find a lot of MPS4 patients, uh, not in Brazil, but the rest of South America. Uh, so we know there is definitely a much larger opportunity than there was for Nagazab. So when you look, I think you've identified 1,200 patients so far. You're thinking you'll have 1,500 by the time of launch. We guesstimated, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think you'll have exhausted rare genetic clinics or that you can find these other patients and you've mentioned skeletal dysplasia and so forth? Um, yeah, I, I think actually we will continue to find patients in, um, in genetics uh, clinics uh, that haven't been properly diagnosed or identified, but then also we are starting... Now that you know, the product is moving towards registration, our representatives are spending time 
identifying patients beyond genetic centers into indeed uh, uh, so-called skeletal dysplasia centers and uh, orthopedic surgery centers, pediatric orthopedic surgeons in some countries that are pretty involved in the care of those patients. And we're just starting that effort. That's why uh, <clears throat> you know, we haven't seen that many results yet, but we anticipate that indeed we should be able to identify another 200 to 300 patients between now and launch. Uh, thanks to those, identi to those uh, patient ad identification efforts. Great. And then we're going to see Pompeii data um, for your drug by end of March, I believe. Yes. So, yeah, uh, we have communicated, and, and I'm, I'm confirming that we will have the BMN701 uh, data for our Pompeii product uh, by the end of March. So okay. Probably a little bit more than a month uh, from now. Actually, on Friday at the World Conference in Orlando, uh, it's a conference of lysosomal uh, storage diseases. Uh, there's a presentation from Dr. Barry Burns uh, that is the principal, one of the key investigators in the, in the study that will uh, actually communicate about the baseline characteristics of our patients as compared to the baseline characteristics of the patients in the pivotal study for Lumizyme, the so-called LOT study, uh, which is the adult Pompeii. Uh, patient population database for Genzyme, which led to the approval of, of Lumizyme. That's very important uh, because we want to make sure that when we communicate the data, uh, if it is positive, <laughs> that uh, people understand that there were not major differences uh, between the two patient population. So that's kind of an important uh, uh, message. And I think Dr. Burns also will uh, review uh, the different variables that clinicians use to actually evaluate the health status of the patients, one of them being, of course, in walk distance, although that's mainly done when you're in clinical trial, but the importance also of pulmonary functions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are measuring many different variables of pulmonary function in this trial, FEV1, FVC, MEP, uh, and, uh, and we're going to be reporting data on all those variables. Um, and uh, as you know, we have always said when we started this uh, program that our intent was to move to phase three only if uh, we had a clearly superior uh, product as compared to Lumizyme in terms of efficacy. Uh, since F, you know, Lumizyme's efficacy, you know, out, of, out of 60 patients in the last study, they only had four super responders, so a few responders. Um, <clears throat> so we, you know, we hope to do better than that. Uh, so all this you're going to know in about a month or so. Uh, should we decide to move to phase three? Uh, we will be doing it very likely uh, with a new cell line that is more productive than the current cell line. Uh, so we anticipate start of phase three by the end of 14. We're looking at ways to actually potentially accelerate that a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. but we communicate about it uh, uh, by the end of March when we report the data. Right. It's very so, exciting. So what would superiority mean? So would it be if, you, if, you, if, you, if we've seen four super responders in the LOTS trial, you know, is there a cutoff that you want to see um, there with, with your drug or um, walk distance improvement or pulmonary function improvement? So, yeah, so we got to look at all uh, the variables that we're measuring and the totality of the data. We're going to look at, you know, average increase in walk, number of uh, significant responders, let's say over, you know, 50 meters or so. The average increase in velocity was, I think, 27 meters or so. And we're going to look at all the pulmonary functions and analysis and variables, and um, and then and then determine. I mean, when you look at the data, data is it clear that potentially this product has a superior efficacy profile as compared to Lumizyme? So we don't want to. Uh, well, we uh, again I encourage you to look at the, to attend or listen to the Dr. Barry Burns presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was going to lay out you know all the variables we're going to look at and uh, what he and most clinicians will consider it as a significant difference. Okay. But I, want, I don't want to preempt his talk, it's you know, a few days. Sure, no, definitely. <coughs> um, maybe we'll just talk about the PAR program because that's the next data set mm -hmm. we'll get after Pompeii. But um, we'll see that at ASCO. And what should we really expect from the data set at, at ASCO? Yeah. So again, I think what we have communicated so far, you know, last year we did a uh, uh, those, those findings study, uh, we, try to, we try to determine what is the maximum tolerated dose in solid tumors, specifically uh, ovarian cancer patients and breast cancer patients uh, with BRCA mutations. Mm -hmm. uh, we have established that dose. Uh, 
it's uh, basically one milligram per day. So not one milligram per kilogram, one milligram per day. Extremely important product. Uh, we showed, uh, we have seen sign of efficacy uh, of objective response at 100 microgram, mm -hmm. which is one tenth of the maximum tolerated dose. So you have a huge, I mean, a very nice 10 to one therapeutic ratio. If you step back, you have to understand that BMN673 was designed to be the optimized PARP inhibitor in terms of bioavailability, in terms of specificity to the PARP receptors, in terms of half-life and pharmacokinetics and dynamics. This is a true once-a-day drug. It's oral therapy. Uh, and we have side-by-side -side data showing that it's, it's way more potent than any other PARP inhibitors in development. Uh, the most advanced has been the one from AstraZeneca or Laparib, and uh, we have signs of efficacy that are, in terms of tumor uh, cell killing abilities, 1,000 times more important than, than Olaparib. So, and that's important in cancer, as you know, because then, you know, generally it results in, in more efficacy for the same toxicity or, or more same efficacy for less toxicity. So we are very excited about it. So where we stand, so we, we communicate that uh, so far in, a bre in BRCA breast, BRCA mutated breast, uh, sorry, ovarian cancer patients, we had, out of 12 patients, we had 67% of the patients with objective response in terms of tumor reduction using resist criteria. Uh, and that's a single agent in end stage refractory ovarian cancer patients that are refractory to any therapy. Uh, they don't receive anything. Uh, they're basically, uh, you know, in a, in a very bad shape here. So, that's, you know, that's why we're very excited about it. So now we, we are rolling more uh, BRCA breast. We have, we have significant data in ovarian. We, we're generating data in BRCA breast patients. We, have to, we hope to have data for ASCO in uh, late May, early June uh, in about 10, in addition to the 12 or so uh, BRCA ovarian, uh, about 10 BRCA breast patients at maximum uh, tolerated dose at one milligram per day. Uh, to then determine and inform our decision to whether to move as our first phase three into BRCA ovarian or BRCA breast. Uh, it's clearly the product, the product is clearly effective in BRCA ovarian, very mm -hmm. effective, it's already determined. Uh, the downside of, of ovarian as the first indication is that the uh, progression of disease is much uh, slower than breast, so consequently, if you want to do a uh, survival uh, uh, trial, uh, it takes more time. Mm -hmm. uh, so in addition to the, the, these two things, we are also trying to generate data in Ewing sarcoma, uh, which is a subset of bone cancer, and in small cell lung cancer, where there are very few therapeutic options, as you know. And um, because uh, in, in cancer cell lines, in vitro, it's, it shows that it's potentially extremely effective. And we are starting to generate pre, uh, in vitro data also as combination therapy, but uh, that's the next stage of development. Okay. Any chance that if you see pretty good data in these smaller cancers like Ewing sarcoma or small cell lung, you'd... We, we hope. To... Uh, we're not going to have that many patients by okay. ASCO, but, uh, but, but we, we should have some data there, but okay. at least early, early data. But uh, we hope to have at least one or two cycles of data for BRCA breast, which nobody okay. has seen yet. Okay. So it sounds like BRCA breast is the way you're going to go, or BRCA variant. As a first phase three, but okay. it's likely we'll also very quickly thereafter start another study for a potentially fast track okay. you know, registration strategy with either Ewing sarcoma or small cell lung cancer. Okay. And also we're testing pancreatic cancer. I mean, they have, some of them have BRCA, uh, uh, sorry, prostate cancer, they have BRCA mutations and that might work too. Perfect. And then um, PEGPAL, you know, that's gonna enter into phase three. How should we think about um, how this drug will play out in the marketplace with Kuven already being there, mm -hmm. um, how you know, education physicians might require, how they might opt for this drug versus yeah. not? Uh, so as we communicate, it's uh, very likely we will start the phase three next quarter uh, for PEGPAL uh, with a combination of a discontinuation trial of patients that are currently taking therapy and a placebo control perspective trial. Um, um, we are very excited about the opportunity. I think you wrote in your note this morning that doctors are very excited about mm -hmm. it too. Um, <laughs> the efficacy of PECPAL is order of magnitude better than Kuvan. Uh, actually, we basically, if you look at the patients that have reached chronic therapeutic dose, we, we've been able to get 100% of them down to uh, th therapeutic levels based on the NIH guidelines under 600 micromolar per milliliters of fee. 
so the efficacy of the product is pretty dramatic. Um, if you talk to the patients, the families of the patients, the caregivers, they tell you that their personality changes mm -hmm. uh, dramatically you know, as, on therapy, which we are not really seeing with, with Kuvan. And here we, you know, the data we have generated with this efficacy is in patients that would not respond to Kuvan whatsoever. I mean, the average, the baseline characteristic fee levels of these patients is over 1,200 micromolar, which are, which are neurotoxic levels of fee, and we know the response rate uh, with Kuvan in this patient is zero. So, so I would say initially we're going to target uh, mainly adult patients mm -hmm. with, you know, high fee levels. Uh, those patients obviously are not following the diet. Actually, most adult patients, 80% of them don't follow the diet because it's impossible to follow. And, and the fact that they have these kind of fee levels uh, demonstrate they're not following the diet because mm. a fee uh, can only be obtained from, from food, as you know. So, so, so clearly, uh, we believe, and based on uh, interactions with physicians, that uh, this product has very, very significant value for those, those customers, for those patients. I think eventually we will get to the younger patients and we probably will cannibalize some of the Kuvan business. That's okay. Um, there will always be a segment of Q uh, PKU patients that will, uh, that will stay on Kuvan because it's you know, oral therapy is easier than subcutaneous. Uh, but we are, we are not worried about cannibalization of Kuvan um, mm -hmm. uh, if, if the patient benefits are superior. So if you were a Kuvan patient and you were controlled um, in terms of your fee levels, but you, you're still on dietary restriction, you would assume those patients will be exactly. the, the low I mean, end. Because, you know, that was the issue with Kuvan. We knew Kuvan would work in only half the patients, and it, even in the patients where it works, you know, the, the, the drop in fee is only about 30%. And, and, and a lot of patients were hoping that it would be able to get off diet with Kuvan. Unfortunately, uh, just a minority of them can do that. And I think that hope to getting off diet can be fulfilled by PECPAL. Yep. Uh, so even that's why, even patients that are on Kuvan today, they might switch to PECPAL, assuming that the experience of their clinicians and patients show that the product is safe and effective. Great. Um, and then I, I think two of the other drugs in your pipeline, a condor, the drug for achondroplasia mm -hmm. and Batten's, um, you know, it seems like as we talk to physicians, they view the regulatory path as, as pretty straightforward here in the development path. Yes. So, Although it always of... looks that way at the beginning. <laughs> <you know>, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but, uh, but indeed, uh, we are, uh, uh, we've had very good uh, meetings with regulatory authorities for, for both products. Uh, so we are on track to start our first patient, uh, starting with the echondroplasia product CNP analog. Echondroplasia is the number one cause of human dwarfism in the world. Uh, growth hormone doesn't work in echondroplasia. There's about 24, 25,000 patients between the US and Europe. Uh, many of them are adults, and mm -hmm. it's unlikely our drugs would be effective in most of those patients, but, but at least for, we believe that a drug would be very effective in, in improving the symptoms and making the patient grow uh, if it's taken between birth and age 15 or 16 or so. Uh, so we're starting our trial again uh, you know, by, by mid-year or so. We are developing a, a potential another uh, uh, clinical pathway, which is to look at a subsegment of achondroplastic patients that have very severe form of the disease. Um, you know, in these patients, all the bones are too small, including a bone that connects your, your skull to your spine. It's called the foramen magnum, and that bone is a circular bone, but its bone is also too small in these patients, and results in spinal cord compression. That is pretty significant, resulting in uh, uh, people having, you know, not to be able to have mobility anymore, ending up in wheelchairs potentially. So they generally have surgery today, which is a major surgery, as you imagine, doing that on a little kid uh, uh, to expand the size of this bone with this, you know, around the spinal cord. So we try to see if we could develop a protocol for these patients whereby we would uh, delay or eliminate the need for surgery in these patients. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned on that. But that would be in parallel to the, the mainstream development pathway whereby we're going to try to demonstrate improvement in growth velocity, mm -hmm. which we've shown in, in mice and in monkeys already, uh, growth velocities in patients with achondroplasia. We believe we can do, we have, we could believe we can show signs of efficacy within six months of treatment. So that's, you know, relatively fast. That study, by the way, phase two is not a, the people who study, this is just a, a study to find what's the right dose to give to these patients, but we could move to phase three pretty quickly thereafter. 
So uh, a lot of excitement about the drug in actually the achondroplastic community. Yeah. Uh, achondroplastic children are born, 80% of them from normal parents. It's a random mutation. It's diagnosed before birth. You can see that with a ultrasound, uh, looking at the limbs of the fetus because they are disproportionate and they're too short. The good news then about that is that you can treat patients potentially from birth because they are diagnosed before birth. And, and you know, when, when, when parents are told they're going to have a chondroplastic kid, uh, the, genetic, the geneticists tell you that the first thing they ask is, what could we do about it? And then right now, there's nothing. So a lot of hope about what we could do here. Very exciting uh, project, too. And we need to talk about uh, TPP1. Or, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so TPP1 is uh, developed for a, a form of Batten's disease, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disease, which is extremely uh, severe. Uh, patients are generally diagnosed by the age of three or so. A, a very, very uh, progress, fastly progressing. Um, and patients die by the age of 10 or 12, unfortunately. Um, and we have now demonstrated uh, and, and it's, a, it's a genetic mutation, again, that, that, uh, that is the cause of the disease. There is a large animal model of, of, of uh, dogs that have, that have the disease, and uh, we were able to identify uh, those dogs, and also that's why we, we treated them with our product, and um, we were able to more than double their life expectancy. Those dogs in general die in about six months or so. Mm -hmm. And we have dogs that have been alive now after treatment, I mean, dogs with the disease for over a year. And if you, show, if you would see videos of the dog, you would see there is a huge difference between an untreated dog and a treated dog. So um, very exciting uh, yeah, project to um, the incidence of uh, the subform of Batten's disease called Linsil. Um, uh, the incidence of Linsil is, uh, is about similar to actually MPS6, which is a disease we treat with Nagozyme, our biggest product. The prevalence is about half of MPS6 mm -hmm. in lot less because the patient dies so quickly. Uh, what we hope is that, uh, assuming our treatment is approved and commercialized to potentially increase the life expectancy of the patients, increase the prevalence. We had very positive meetings with regulatory authorities. Uh, and this could be an extremely accelerated development process because of the severity and lethality of the disease. So the best case, and it's possible that this first study in patient could be the pivotal study. It will be a right. phase one, two, and three together. Uh, so uh, we're going to try to move as fast as possible. Great. <clears throat> Maybe one last question. Um, you know, how actively are you pursuing uh, drugs to in license or, or to acquire, and, and if you're looking at those, what, are, what targets are you looking for? So obviously we are, we're not extremely hungry for new products sure. because we have a pretty <laughs> big pipeline with, and uh, actually our organizations, um, even if we license the drug, uh, would have some difficulty to um, uh, develop those programs in addition to what we're managing today. But uh, because of the prominence of uh, Palmer in today, the fact we've been successful, we have a track record in orphan diseases, we are getting a lot of calls from different smaller companies that need a partner, and so we're always looking at different things. Um, uh, an area we are paying attention to, starting to pay attention to, is gene therapy, mm -hmm. uh, because we are a genetic company, basically, mm -hmm. and, um, and we see is that as a great opportunity potentially for us, complementary to what we do. So potentially down the road in long term, a threat to some of our business that so we need to be involved. So, yeah. so that's an area we're looking at. That's great. Um, I'm just going to turn it over to the audience if there are any questions. Do you want to move to the microphone? Sure. <clears throat> sure. I knew you basically as an orphan drug company, as everybody else did. And now you're talking about going to ASCO. Um, obviously, you're into cancer. Did that, how did you get there? Did that just come out by serendipity from some of your science you were doing with orphan drugs, or did you decide to go off in a totally different direction? So that's a very good question. Actually, we had, we had that question a lot when we acquired. So we got there by acquiring co a small company called Lee Therapeutics so over two years ago. I mean, almost three now, I think, or <laughs> three years ago. Um, 
And we got there, and we tried to explain that when we made that acquisition, which actually was not a very expensive acquisition. We paid about $20 million up front uh, for a drug that's potentially a blockbuster drug, $1 billion plus, I think. Uh, and we got there because the cancer, uh, cancer therapy is moving, or has already moved, in terms of hematology, oncology, towards the orphan business model. In the sense that instead of treating uh, you know, 100 women with breast cancer with one drug, and you know it's going to be effective only in 35% of them, uh, you just try to identify through molecular genetics uh, which, which woman will respond to your drug and do personalized medicine targeted therapy uh, and try to be very effective in, in, those, in, in those patients. Uh, I can say that because you know, years ago when I worked at Ron Poulencourt, I launched Taxotere in the US and worldwide, so I know a little bit about that. And I think we're trying to do something better now. Uh, and if you, then if you take 15% uh, you know, of, of ovarian cancer patients in the US, you're talking what, three, 4,000 mm -hmm. patients in the US, it becomes an ultra orphan disorder. And that's our business. And indeed, this is a multi-genetic, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a monogenetic disorder anymore, but, but it is got a, genetic, a clear genetic component. Uh, if, if we do our phase three BRCA breast, BRCA ovary, we're going to have to do a genetic testing with those patients to determine if they will respond to our drug before we give them the drug. That's how we got, we got there. We have Great. time for another question? No? We might have time for one more question. I think we run out of time. Great. Okay. Well, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, JJ. Thank you.